Hi, good evening. Welcome to our class this evening and see your garden grow. Our presenter will be Mandy Dixon, who is a master gardener, and we will be watching her garden attempt to grow. This is a, one of our Green Living Series classes that is made possible from a generous support of the Kalamazoo Community Foundation, Love Where You Live Environment Fund. And they have enabled us to present these Green Living classes to you through their generous and continued support of our mission in making education opportunities like the Green Living Series possible. We'd really like to thank them. It's really made a difference in what we've been able to bring to you. As I said, our class tonight, our presenter will be Mandy. She'll be talking and showing us some video clips. Hi, Mandy. Hi, Jean. So good to have you back. We, it's great. It's been a while. We, we love to learn more about how to take care of our gardens and with any luck, grow some tomatoes or zucchinis or whatever it is you want to plant. And I know Absolutely. it's always a challenge, and I know you're going to share some of those challenges with us this evening. Absolutely. Oh. We're going to... Go ahead. Say we're going to go through quite a bit today, so... Um, please, if you're watching this live, you are welcome to put questions in the comment box and we will attempt, well, Mandy will attempt to order, answer them. Don't let me answer your gardening questions. <laughs> I just learned I was going to kill everything from asking your question before <laughs> class. So listen to Mandy um, and she will give us tips that will help our garden grow instead of die, I hope. <laughs> So go ahead, Mandy. We are so glad you're here and please give us your presentation. Excellent. Well, let's start um, just talking about the garden. And this year was a little bit of a tricky year for a lot of us, but especially my garden. So we're going to look at some of the general garden vegetables and some of the trigger, the problems that you can have and how to overcome some of them. So if we want to get started. I'm calling it my summer garden tour because we're just going to go through a lot of different pictures and little videos and we'll um, talk about that. So next slide. So one of the things I want to talk about is well-known vegetable plants as well as some of the common pest diseases. Um, like we said, we're just there's going to be quite a few different things, but let's see what we can do to help you with your garden. Next slide. So first we're gonna talk about zucchinis and summer squashes. Um, it's a very common thing that people like to grow. When you start growing zucchini, you get so many of them, they're everywhere and you can give them away to your friends and neighbors. Um, but I wanted to show you some of the parts of the zucchini plant here. So if you can see, they've got the nice big green leaves in the top right there. It's a very big plant. Um, so make sure you have space for it. And then you can see the flowers down below. And some of those flowers, like in the middle bottom it has a a flower attached to the plant still um, the one below that has that and then the one above doesn't have a zucchini um, but it has the flower so that's how you know the difference between the male and the female flowers the female flowers will have the little teeny tiny little zucchini attached and it'll be very very small and then the male flowers will just have a stem so that's just one little tip of how to know if it's a female flower and going to give you a zucchini or if it's a male flower that has to pollinate your zucchinis or summer squashes. So let's go to the next slide. And there's several challenges with zucchini, but if you can overcome those challenges, you're going to have so many zucchini or summer squashes. Um, I know I love those, a little bit of tomato, a little onion. Um, there's a lot of ways to prepare it. There's zucchini breads. Um, so this is a great vegetable to have. And there's just a couple of things that tend to happen to your zucchini plants. So the first one is the squash vine borer. And we're going to show what that that um, pest can do here in a, just a little bit because I've got a video. Um, but we'll talk about that here in a second. And then the powdery mildew is another common disease that you'll see. But that doesn't actually necessarily kill the plant um, as long as it's kept under control it'll just make the plant look really bad and it'll get kind of weak so it won't produce as much. Um, but one of the nice things is even if you get that, you, your plant will still produce, it'll just slow way down. Um, there's a lot of ways to prevent it, which include keeping 
enough space between your zucchini plants. So like you saw how big that plant was in the first picture, if you try to crowd it, you're going to end up with too little space and you're more likely to get this powdery mildew. So those are some of the little tips that we're going to talk about. But let me show you in the next slide um, a little video about one of the plant zucchini plants in my garden this year um, that's had multiple issues. So we're going to play that video now. Uh, the video is a little jumpy, but if you see that plant right there in front is a zucchini plant, but you don't see the big leaves on top. The reason you don't see those big leaves on top is I had a woodchuck, also known as a groundhog, that came through and you can see the stem there's where the leaves would have been, but he came through and ate them all. And then I also had squash vine borer on this specific plant. So if you can see, there's a lot of little holes in the stem of that plant. Had that plant had a lot of leaves, those leaves would probably be very wilty by the middle of the day because it was losing water through all of those holes. Um, and if you look, it sh literally shredded it. Now what a squash vine borer does is it, it lays its eggs right at the very base of the stem and those get into the stem. So when, you're, when the larva hatch, they start eating the And that's how you end up with all this stringy mess. And what it does is the zucchini can't get water from the roots to the top of the plant very easily because a lot of those stem connections are damaged or destroyed completely. So that's one of the big things, but you can still see it has some flowers. It's still trying and it has a few little leaves. Um, so that plant is still going to try to live, but it's going to have a hard time because of those two different issues. So those are the big zucchini squimmer squash type issues. Some of those will also happen on winter squash. Um, so you will st still see that a little bit, just not as much. But let's go to the next slide and see what else we have. So artichokes. I don't know if you knew this, but you can grow artichokes in Michigan. I have done it. I did not do it this year, but I have done it. And it's a very, very cool plant. So if you go to the next slide, we'll show you what the plant looks like. This is a plant that I had in my garden a couple years ago on the left. And you can see the big old spiky kind of looking leaves. And then it grows a stalk. And on the top of the stalk is the artichoke. Now, if you don't cut that stalk off, you can see here on the right, the stalk will bloom into a beautiful purple flower. But obviously you can't eat it at that point. So you have to decide, do you want the pretty flower? Or do you want the artichoke? Um, it, most of the time you need to grow them as annuals or you have to give them a lot of cover. If the plants are healthy with good nutrition, they have very minimal pests. Um, the worst thing I've ever seen is some aphids and aphids. Um, you just have to really wash them off and wash them away. Um, aphids are pretty minor as long as you keep up on keeping them off the plants, insecticidal soaps, or just washing them off. So let's go to the next. Brussels sprouts and cabbages. Those are another nice plant to have in your garden. Um, they do have some different challenges, but let's go to the next slide and look at some of the plants. You can see on the top, you've got the top of a Brussels sprout plant. Now that plant goes all the way down and there's leaves all along the way. But if you look at the bottom picture on the right, if you cut off those leaves, that's what the Brussels sprouts look like. So they're teeny little balls that just grow bigger and bigger on the stem, all the way up and down the stem. And between those balls is the actual leaves that go up and down. And you can take those off as they grow, but usually you do that closer to harvest. On the left, you'll see we have a cabbage plant, which is a giant, nice big plant. You can see how well mulched that is. Um, and they've got a lot of leaves. Now on the next slide, we'll see that there's a big pest for cabbages and Brussels sprouts. And that is your cabbage worms. The cabbage worms is that little, that starts with that moth down there on the bottom. They lay their eggs on your cabbages they hatch very quickly into those lovely little green larva worms, and then they start attacking your plants. Best control is to try to get them off either when they're still eggs, you just have to check the undersides of all of your leaves. Very difficult, but 
somewhat doable um, or catch them when they're small before they start making a lot of damage. Um, you can use floating row cover, which looks like really thin like screen or netting. And you can put that over your plants and pin it down. Um, otherwise, you're going to end up with a lot of holes and a lot of damage from these worms. But on the next slide, we're going to talk about tomatoes. Tomatoes is one of my favorite plants and vegetable. So we've got a lot of different varieties. This picture on the right is a basket of tomatoes that I harvested from my garden last year. You can see there's the round ones, they're the small cherry, they're different colors, there's different stripes. Um, I usually plant them along a fence and attach them to the fence so they've got support. The biggest thing with tomatoes is making sure they have support and that they have room to grow. If you don't keep enough space, you're gonna end up with a lot more diseases. And you can see a sample of one of the different shapes of the tomatoes there on the left. On the next slide, we're gonna talk about some of the, oh, actually we're gonna look at the video first. So this is a video of this year's garden, which has a lot of challenges, um, but I'll talk you through it as we go. So you can see here, what you're seeing is there's some sweet peppers, which we can talk about here in a minute. Sweet peppers have very, very few pests, very few diseases, they pretty much have those little flowers that will turn into peppers. Um, hot peppers are basically the same. They have little flowers, they turn into peppers, and they will just grow as long as you have enough heat and don't overwater them, they're gonna do fabulous. Um, sweet peppers start out green, and then if they are a variety that will change to red or yellow or orange, they will turn into that as they ripen. So there's a couple different peppers there. And then behind it, you can see a lot of different plants, but we're gonna look at the tomatoes. So the tomatoes are looking okay at the top here. You've got a little bit of a dead leaf there that broke. Looks like the video froze a little bit, but here's some of the diseases that you can end up. Um, so you can see that there's still tomatoes on the plants, even though you've got diseases. Uh, these are fungal diseases of various sorts but you can see how beautiful and big those tomatoes are and they will still ripen. The whole tops are filled with good amount of leaves. Um, these are all soil-based diseases. So they splash up from the soil when it rains. So when we had all those really heavy rains and there wasn't enough mulch, that's when you're gonna end up with those diseases. Now here, I'm gonna show you one, I've got a tomato back there, but I also have some chive heads. So I've let these um, actually, I'm sorry, these are the green onions. I've let some of the onions grow from last year to this year. So this year, they are starting to flower at the top. Um, and in one of the other videos, I'm going to show you how you can get seeds from those flowered onions. So if you left one or two in the ground still and they flower, you can then have seeds for your next harvest. I've got a little bit of dill there, but what I'm trying to show you here is the cabbages. So I had cabbages last year. I did have cabbage worms. They did destroy a couple of my cabbages completely. Even the row cover moved in a nice windstorm and I didn't notice. But what happened is the cabbages formed a stalk and started flowering. And now I have all of these little pods. So if you see the pods, hard to see, apologize, but you can see the pods and those look like little teeny tiny little beans. If you split open the pods, once they're ripe, those are all the cabbage seeds. So for my garden next year, I will have seeds from my cabbage that I can grow again. Cabbages are one of those plants that do seeds every other year. So the first year you can pick your plant. If you leave the stalk and a little bit of the plant in there, next year it may start sprouting for you. If it starts sprouting, you'll get some flowers and then you can collect those seeds. So it's kind of a little different light cycle than some of the plants, because a lot of the plants you saw, like the peppers, they have the flowers and the seeds are in the vegetable. For cabbages, they have their plant, their plants the first season, and then the second season, you get your seeds. So let's go to the next slide and keep going. So here is a, another video of some tomato. These are in a little bit better shape, a lot less um, disease. So let's watch this video. So you can see here, we've got several plants, nice, healthy green foliage. 
But look at the different kinds of tomatoes. We have some stripes with a little bit of orange color. They're going to turn into a dark red with stripes. And then we've got some plants over here um, with various different colors and shapes. Here you can see there's a, a tomato that's red on the bottom. So it's going to have a dark cap. And that's mostly from the different sun exposure. Red tomato. This one's gonna be more of a burgundy color. And then we're going to look at another sample tomato. I'm trying to get that one so you can see it a little better. And so there's some more of those striped ones. So there's different shapes, sizes, color, but see how nice and healthy and dark those leaves are? That's a sign of a good, healthy plant. So let's go to the next slide. These are the two primary issues you'll have with tomatoes. One is fungal diseases. This example is early blight. Um, you can see the spots and it's got nice rings. Um, there's different, different fungal diseases though you're gonna have. There's early blight, there's um, septoria. Uh, but basically, the biggest thing with tomatoes and fungal diseases is one, space your plants out further. Rotate your plants. I didn't have a chance to do that this year. I did not rotate. So the diseases from last year are in my soil. So even though I mulched, I didn't mulch heavy enough. You want to mulch a good couple of inches at least. And since I did not do that this year, I'm ending up with more soil diseases. When the rain come down, it splashes the soil up onto the bottom leaves and then the bottom leaves get that fungus and then that fungus spreads through spores because those spores now are airbound or airborne. Um, so that's one of the big things with tomatoes is just making sure that you clean up all of your any diseased leaves out of the garden at the end of the season. Make sure you give them space so they don't have a, that collect that um, humidity as much and they're not touching each other in case one does start to get it. Um, another thing is just making sure you're keeping them a little bit um, heavily, not a little bit, heavily mulched. The heavier the mulch is, the less disease and weed problems you'll have. Now, the other fun disease or um, pest is actually the tomato hornworm. And these things creep me out, <laughs> but they are actually harmless. That Bike that it looks like they have that they can stab you with. They really can't do anything with that. Um, what they do though is they go and then they start eating your leaves. They get on your, you know, the eggs hatch, they start eating your leaves and they get large fast. Uh, most of the time when I find them, they're a good three to four inches long. Um, so you, the best way to deal with those is just to pick them off. Now, if you are lucky to have a lot of beneficial insects in your garden, you may see one with a lot of little, looks like grains of rice on it. That means that a parasitic wasp has decided that that is where it, it wants to have its babies. So what will happen is those eggs will hatch and they will eat that tomato hornworm so that you will have more parasitic wasps, which will kill the tomato hornworms. So you won't have this problem in the future. So if you can handle it, just leave that one alone. If he has little grains of rice on his back, just leave him alone and you will have more beneficial insects and you probably won't have to deal with tomato hornworms next year. Let's go to the next slide. Now this is an example. I planted these um, and I realized after the fact that these were very, this was very poor potting soil. I had a struggle with this potting soil. Um, as you start to use potting soil, you'll figure out that different brands have different qualities and different uses. And this one apparently wasn't a very good potting soil because most of the time you don't need to add extra food to your plants. So I just kind of wanted, I left these alone. I was going to fertilize and I was like, no, this will be a great example of what a plant looks like when it doesn't have enough nutrients. So if we hit play, because this is a little video, you can see the plant is really thin and it doesn't have a lot of leaves. These plants usually get to good three to four. They're still container plants, but they get three to four feet tall and they're nice and bushy most years for me. But you can see how scrawny these things look. They just don't have enough nutrients to build that big bulky base 
of leaves that it needs to be nice and healthy and full. Um, you can also see it's having some problems with um, pollination. Those spots on the tomato don't hurt anything. They just look weird. It just means it wasn't fully pollinated um, when it was initially forming. But like I said, I just wanted to kind of show you some of those struggles that you have to have or that you can have with container plants. So if you see this where they're not growing very well, you may want to add additional fertilizer to your pots. Otherwise, they should be getting a lot full. So let's go to the next slide. Now this year I had a lot of hungry critters issues, um, but you can, we, these are one of the bigger challenges, <laughs> literally, that you'll have for your garden. Some people have deer issues. You can see the little baby bunny I had in my garden one year, um, found him and warned him my garden was not a salad bar, but he was adorable. And so he got to stay until I started planting plants and then I locked up the garden into, with a nice fence. Um, but then you've got the woodchuck groundhog, and he has been the bane of my existence this year. But I'll show you more about that here in a minute. So let's go to the next slide. So this is my garden. This is the nice um, blackberries right here in front and my rain barrel right behind them. But if you hit play on this video, you'll see where Mr. Woodchuck got into the garden. So I was looking, I'm like, what the heck? Why is everything eaten? And then I found his hole right there. So he dug his way under my shed and into my garden. Even though there's fencing there, he went under it. But you can see I still have a ton of blackberries. So this blackberry plant that I planted four years ago has kind of taken over this whole corner of my garden. So I dig up little parts of it and I trim it back. But you can see I have so many blackberries that it's difficult to keep up on. But they are everywhere. There's a lot of them that are still starting that haven't turned black yet but all summer long i will have blackberries as soon as they start ripening they just don't stop so you can see how this whole took took over this whole corner and that's where i originally planted it was on the other side of the fence <laughs> um, but there's a lot of blackberries so some of these fruits are really easy to grow this is a thornless blackberry so you don't have to deal with the thorns and obviously the woodchuck doesn't care that it's there he leaves it alone the biggest pest you could have is some of the, um, it's called spotted drosophilia. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it attacks the ripe fruits. So if you get them just as they're ripening and get them in the refrigerator right now, you shouldn't have a problem. But if they start getting just a little bit overripe, you might end up with a lot of those. And this last plant here is a container blueberry plant. So you can plant blueberries just in a pot. These, this is a little ver a version, I think it's called top hat. But ultimately, there's several different kinds of container blueberry plants. And if you just have at least two of them to cross pollinate, unless you happen to get a variety that's fine with independently pollinating itself, um, you can grow blueberries. So as you can see, we've got a lot of fruits in the garden that you can grow. Some of them need a lot of space, like the blackberries, and others of them can grow just in a little bitty pot. So let's go to the next slide. So now we're going to talk about herbs and edibles, other edibles. One of the things I like about herbs is most of the time you won't have any issues with diseases or pests with herbs. They're very strong smelling. Occasionally you will have something, but most of them won't. So this picture is, again, those onions um, that I let grow a little bit, but, you know, I left it over the winter. So I left a few of them over the winter so I could collect seeds from them. So let's go to the next slide and we'll see this video. This is mint. So this is when you let mint grow and get large. So you can see here, you can see the little leaves and it grew all the way from the ground all the way up. And then it's got some flowers at the top here. So mint does flower, it does have seeds, although typically you grow it from root cuttings. Um, it spreads very, very easily and it smells amazing. Um, I think this is going to show the chives. I planted some garlic chives and they flowered a beautiful purple flower this summer. And now these are the seed heads and those seed heads I can take off and put in a bag and use all the seeds to grow more garlic chives next year. Is that the end? I think that might be the end of the video, but I'm not sure. 
Okay, so then this now is the one of my front beds, and you can see right there in front, that is fennel that I let to flower. I do like to leave a little bit of my different herbs and um, plants to seed for the next year. So I leave a little bit of it to grow, um, and the fennel is kind of taking over this whole area right in the front. And to the right, I have some dill that I also let grow because I love to have fresh dill and, and dill seed is good for pickles. Um, but this is fennel and dill. And if we hit play, it'll just show you a little closer view of those plants. So this is what the fennel flowers look like. Um, you'll notice they look very... And then we're going to come around the corner and look at the dill here a little closer but you can also see now those onions they've turned from the white flowery thing into this dark brown and i'm going to take off some of those seeds for you just so you can see what how small they are but they come right out of those flower pods and there's your seeds so those i will take off and plant some of those next year and then here's your dill and the dill will form little seeds on the ends that you can also take off and regrow. Dill is very, very easy. I planted it in my garden once and I ended up with dill for the rest of my life <laughs> because it freely recedes. So let's go to the next slide. Now this is fruit. We're talking about fruit. We have the blackberries and we have container blueberries. Well, many years ago, well, many, I say five to six years ago, I planted a peach tree. Um, and then I planted a second one a year or two later, but this is my peach tree this year. So this year, um, I think if you hit play, I show a little bit close up of some of the fruit, but this year the peach tree went a little, little happy. It's a very happy peach tree. Um, and all the fruits are starting to ripen right now. This, this was a few weeks ago. So right now they're almost done. Um, I did have some issues with some a fungus. It's been a very humid year, and that tends to help keep fungal diseases spreading. Um, but I still got a couple of bushels off of this peach tree. And this is just a backyard peach tree. It's a red haven. Um, peaches do not need a second tree. So if you have room for a small tree or a tree, you can get dwarf varieties of these peach trees. Um, but if you have room for a tree, you certainly can get fruit. It's going to take you a good four to five years for them to really start producing. But um, there's my second tree. It's a lot. It's a little smaller. It's a different variety. But he has round donut shaped peaches. So you can see that here. They're not the same shape, um, but they're a white peach. And let's go to the next slide. Oh, I guess it wasn't quite done. <laughs> ah, there's another type of um, fungal disease. So generally for my peach trees, I treat them um, with a antifungal just in the very, very early spring before the leaves are even on the plant. Um, and then I do it at the end of the year before the, or right after the leaves fall off. So I'm treating it basically in the winter twice. And the reason you do that is to prevent these diseases. So those little puckerings was probably just an area where I missed a little bit of um, spray because that puckering can turn into a red spot and those leaves can start falling off if you get a lot of that on the tree. Obviously one leaf or two leaves that I might've overlooked the spray area doesn't hurt the tree at all. Um, but I just wanted to kind of show you that's a thing um, that you can do. Now it looks like Dorothy had a question. Do I store my container blueberries in the garage in winter? No, I leave them in the garden, but I cover them in straw or leaves. Last year I did leaves. I did a whole, I just gathered all my leaves from the yard and I dumped them on top of it. And I put them in kind of a protected space um, under those leaves. So they've got a little bit of a cushion of insulation from the cold winter. So that's how I was able to keep them in the containers over the winter. You could bring them into the garage. The only thing you have to be careful with is your plants could dry out if you don't keep them very, very lightly watered, maybe once a month. You don't want to put a lot on there, but you just don't want them to completely dry out. 
So that's why I like to just tuck them in the corner of the garden and then just cover them with either straw or a bunch of fall leaves. So let's go to the next slide. Pollinators are very important for your garden. So I wanted to show you a little bit of the pollinators that I have in my garden. And part of it's because I let some of this stuff grow and bloom the next year. So let's go to the next slide. And this is it's going to start with my leeks, which are basically kind of an oniony type of thing. And I just enjoy them in a supplement. I didn't grow onions this year, so I grew these because they're a little easier. Um, but if you hit play, I'll show you some of my herbs and some of the pollinators that I have in the garden. So you can see how nice and healthy those are. Those are very healthy leeks. Um, and obviously the groundhog woodchuck, he didn't care about those. So that's one thing. But this is my basil. I let some of my basil go to flower, but if you look through this video, there's a lot of bees hovering around on all the blossoms from the basil. They just love it. I've had like, when I was videoing, there was at least four of them just hovering around and going to leaf from flower to flower to flower, just hanging out, enjoying it. So pollinators are really important for your garden and for your harvest. And as you can see, just letting some basil go to seed helps encourage them to hang out in your garden. Let's go to the next slide. Now this is another, this is just flowers. I throw some flowers in my garden to help encourage pollinators. The more pollinators you have in your garden, the more vegetables you will end up with because they're the ones that do all the work. Now, if you hit play on this, you'll see this one's actually just a butterfly. I had a bee on there. He disappeared before I got my video camera out, but there was a nice butterfly hanging out. Um, so I bury, I put little clumps of flowers in my garden, very, all over in various areas between the vegetables. One, they encourage pollinators, but two, they also encourage beneficial insects. And sometimes those insects take care of other pests for you. For the longest time, I had no tomato hornworms. And, you know, it's, some of that is just having those pollinators and those beneficial insects in your gardens. They help with some of the pests. So let's go to the next slide. So one of the things I want to talk about a little bit is called integrated pest management. So it's a way to manage insects, diseases, weeds, animals, and other pests that cause damage by combining different things. So you can use biological methods, you can use cultural methods, mechanical, chemical practices. So that means like, cultural practices is cleaning up all of your diseased leaves at the end of the season. Anything that's got disease, you get rid of. Um, mechanical is weeding, literally just weeding. Chemical practices using the right, uh, you know, an, as minimal chemical as necessary, but if you need that, use those careful, carefully. Um, so there's certain steps you do in order to make sure you're using what you need, but not anything more. So first you identify those pests, you try to prevent them. So row covers, fences, obviously sometimes they get through the fences or the row covers, but if you can prevent them from getting into your garden, into your plants, then you'll be better off. Scout, that means keep an eye out for those pests, like those cabbage hornworms or those cabbage worms or the tomato hornworms. You can just take those and pick them off your plants. You don't need to use chemicals for those as long as you're keeping an eye out for them. And then you establish a tolerance for the pests. You're going to have pests. It's going to happen. But how bad does it have to be before your, your harvest is really going to be damaged that you can't live with it? So like that tomato hornworm, for example, he's eating my plant, but he does happen to have those little rice grains that you know are parasitic wasps on him. How much can I stand for him to still eat? Can I leave him there? Or is he already really killed off that plant, so I need to get rid of him? If you can leave him there, leave him there. If you can't, take him off and, you know, kill him. For example, if you've got aphids, if it's getting really bad, you need to probably pull out the insecticidal soap. But if you just have a few, you can probably just wash them off. So it's deciding how much of a tolerance you can handle on your plants for that specific plant and that pest. So then selecting a effective and environmentally friendly methods. So keep your tools clean. So if you're pruning, make sure you clean that tool so you're not taking disease from one plant to the next plant. 
garden rotation like I said I didn't do. I didn't move my tomatoes from one bed to a different bed. So the diseases were still there. So the diseases got worse. Handpick the insects or use your insecticidal soaps and horticulture oils depending on what you need. Use proper plant spacing. If you put the right plant in the right place with enough space, you're going to reduce those pests and reduce those diseases. And always start with healthy plants. If you are getting something from a greenhouse, make sure you're checking the bottom of those plants. You don't want to bring home eggs because you don't know whether those can turn into aphids or something else. You don't want to bring home more problems. Or if you have a plant that doesn't look so healthy, don't buy that one and bring it home and put it in your garden unless you know that it's healthy. Um, sometimes those plants could bring back a disease and you just aren't necessarily aware of it, but the health plant doesn't look quite right. So let's go to the next slide. I didn't want to leave you with nothing. These resources can help you use that integrated pest management um, and grow vegetables and a lot of different options and a lot of different ways to answer questions. Um, the first one is a smart vegetables gardening tip sheet. So this teaches you how to be green, use less water, use less pesticides, um, and how to deal with pests and diseases if you do get them. So there's a lot of different tip sheets there that'll help you move your garden forward. Um, the next one is just all about vegetables. It'll tell you how to grow those Brussels sprouts or those cabbages or tomatoes. It has a lot of tips and a lot of sheets on specific vegetables or specific problems like how to deal with deer in your garden. So if you just go to that website, you can find that. And then if you prefer just to talk to somebody, you can give that phone number a call. It's the MSU Lawn and Garden Hotline. You can say, I've got a brown spot in my yard. And you give them a call and they'll be like, here's what you can do to check on and to, to troubleshoot that and or fix it if you've done more. Um, extension volunteers are on that phone line and they will help you. If they can't help you right then, they'll call you back. Um, but that's another resource for you. Let's go to the next. I think that's the end. Oh, if you have any questions, let me know. Hey, Jean. Hi. I have a question about tomatoes. Um, is oh, there... I think we lost her. There you are. There. Um, I have a question about tomatoes. Yes. Do you, have, do you have a favorite variety that has more of that tomato flavor that I remember as a child? And what do you think of like the yellow ones and the orange ones? And, you know, I mean, is it? Are they just pretty or do they really taste different? <laughs> they all taste different. They really do. Every I grow a variety of tomatoes and I pick different ones every year. And I pick certain ones every year because they're just favorite hit. Um, I used to do a tomato tasting party at my house. So I would pull out a good half dozen to a dozen of my tomato varieties and have everyone sample them. Every year, the clear winner was called Sun Gold, and it's a little yellow cherry tomato. And that is the one everyone loved. It's a very sweet, sweet. it's like it's like candy. Um, I personally love the darker tomatoes. They're like the black tomatoes is what they're called. Um, those are some of my favorites because they have a little bit of a, a little bit of almost a it's not really smoky, but that rich, almost smoky flavor. Um, and But if you're looking for some of the more, you know, classic flavors, you can certainly go with like a mortgage lifter or a stump of the world. Or, I mean, there's so many different varieties. I suggest you just pick two or three different, you know, every year just pick one tomato variety that you've never tried before. And some of the greenhouses have a bigger selection than others. You know, you can get your standard aromas or whatever, but there's a few garden greenhouses out there that have several different varieties and just pick one, pick one and try it and see what you think. Um, the green tomatoes, I am not a huge fan because I can't tell when they're ripe. <laughs> that would, 
be an issue, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. So it's like, I look at them and I'm like, I think, so usually you can, they, they turn just a little bit yellow and then you know they're right, but it's really hard for me to tell. So I have a hard time with those, but I love yellow tomatoes. I love your reds. My favorite is the, the black tomatoes. I had one that was called, it's a yellow and orange combo. It's called Hawaiian pineapple. And that was one of my favorite ones too. Yeah, I just have found, um, and I planted some of the old standbys like early girls um, and grape tomatoes and cherry tomatoes. And they just don't have that, oh, it's a real tomato flavor <laughs> to me. Yeah, those aren't, those aren't typically heirlooms. So those are more of your commercial varieties that are designed for either mass production like Romas where you're trying to can them all at once or they're designed so they can be transported from one place to another. So if you want some of those old time flavors, you got to go into the heirlooms. Okay. And what about canning versus freezing for, um, you're going to use the tomato for cooking later. Obviously you're not going to eat it as a side dish, if you freeze a tomato or can a tomato, um, which do you prefer freezing or canning? I do both. I, um, but I freeze in order to can them later. Cause I don't want to heat up my, I don't want to heat up my house in August. <laughs> so I take all of my tomatoes. I chop off the core. I wash them and chop off the core and any damage, throw them in freezer bags, zip them up and throw them in the freezer. And then in January or February, I pull them out, I thaw them, and then I put them through my Roma strainer, which is basically like a big pureeer, and it takes out all the seeds and all of the, the skin, takes it all off. I get puree, and I put them in the pot and cook tomato sauce, and then I can the tomato sauce. So that's one option. You can also can them, but you do need pressure canning. So that means a little more complex equipment and you have to be much more careful. Um, you can water bath can some things with a little bit of extra acid. You just got to make sure you peel them first and it is a process and it takes a lot of time. So I don't do as much of that in the summer, but I do the sauces in the winter. Right. But that's a great tip to just freeze them now and can them later. <laughs> yeah. As long as you're looking for sauce or something pureed or something that right. you're going to cook them later, you can just thaw them and take off the skins and move forward. And to Dorothy's question, do you focus on determinate or indeterminate tomatoes? I do both because I like to can and freeze and just I want the different flavors. So I do both. Now, I like the determinate tomatoes. Um, for like, you know, you've got your standard Roma. I usually do different varieties of Italian tomatoes, but, um, I do those so I can get a bunch of tomatoes all at once, but I like the dwarf varieties because they're great for pots. So I have, you know, you saw those five gallon buckets. I fill up those five gallon buckets with my dwarf varieties, which some of them are determinate and some of them are indeterminate. You have both options for dwarfs nowadays. There's a big variety of dwarfs. There's at least 20, I have at least 20 different varieties of dwarf tomatoes. And I know there's a ton more that I don't have. Um, so I like the dwarfs just for space. I can move them where I need them. I can have them on my porch. Um, but then I have some in the garden and those can be, usually I put the indeterminate ones in the garden because they need a lot more space, but sometimes I'll throw the determinate ones because they still need space, but they just harvest all at once. So it really, I like them both. I look for flavor more than I look for what kind of tomato it is, but I place them in the right spot. So much to learn about tomatoes. You just think you can go to the greenhouse and go, oh, tomato plant. Get tomato. Well, you can. <laughs> you certainly can, though. That's the nice thing about tomatoes. As long as you get a plant, if you give it the right space and the right nutrition and some mulch. Just put it in there. You'll have tomatoes. It may not be the tomato that you wanted, but it will be a tomato. And tomatoes from the garden are amazing. Mm. There is no doubt that a tomato off my plant in the garden is so much better than one from the store. Right. And I know that when you've done gardening classes for us in the past, you taught us, uh, to me, a new 
way to plant your tomato plants. Could you quickly tell people that even though it's a little late to plant a tomato this year? <laughs> <laughs> sure, the method to plant tomato plants. Um, you take your plant, whatever you know size it is, and you're going to take off the bottom stems. So you want to leave just the top, you know, little bush of, of leaves. So you're not getting rid of all of them, but anything that's low on the plant, you're going to get rid of. And then you're going to plant them in the ground as deep as deep or slightly angled because the more of that stem goes into the ground, the more roots that plant will have. So it's going to form roots along that whole stem and that'll give you a stronger, healthier plant. And if you look at the stem of, the, of a tomato plant, it's got little hairs and those all turn into roots for you. Great, because, you know, I mean, it. no matter what you do, if you don't start right, it doesn't help. <laughs> right. Yeah. And again, just make sure you give it a lot of space as well. Make sure you, those plants get large. So make sure you leave enough space. Right. Um, do you plant rhubarb? I have rhubarb in my garden. I do. Um, it just keeps coming back. It, rhubarb is nice and easy. You just put it in there. It grows and it comes back every year. And how is yours doing this year? We did not get a good rhubarb crop this year compared to other years. A little smaller this year than it was, but it's still a nice plant and it's come, it went from being a little rough to now the plant's bigger than it was this spring. Yeah, ours appears to kind of be like, like it, it needed a vacation from the really hot or the really wet. And now it's like, yeah. oh, you're finally giving me normal weather. <laughs> uh, we had a lot of weird weather this year. We had a good, good spout of dry, very dry. My rain barrels went empty and the spout of very wet. Um, it's just been an interesting summer. And that's what happens with gardening. You, you end up with those years where... We had snow in May, and I was like, what the heck? When did snow turn into June 1st? Um, and then you have those years where spring starts early. So it just, it's, it's, it's a challenge, but it's fun. It is. And you still, it, as poorly as some of my things have done this year, I'm still getting stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. Had I not planted it, I wouldn't have that. <laughs> right. My, and this my, year, you know, I agree. Same thing. I had, I got very upset when that woodchuck went into the garden because he ate all my beans, all my melons, all my zucchini. He ate what felt like everything. And I got angry and I walked away from my garden for three weeks. I didn't look at it for three weeks. I came back and you can see all the stuff I had. I have peppers. I have blackberries. I have... Um, a lot of herbs still growing. I have tomatoes still growing at the tops of the plants. There's a ton of tomatoes. The bottom of the plants, the woodchuck's eating them. But everything at the top of the plant is still there. So even if you start it, if you just start, you will have something, especially if you pick some of these herbs or easy to grow plants. The peppers do fabulous. Um, and again, your onions and stuff, they'll just grow even if you're not touching them, as long as you give them a good start. Give them that healthy start, that nutrition, that space, that mulch. And even if you walk away because you get busy, if you come back, it'll still be there. Well, and I think seeing your garden and the fact that you had some issues this year, um, you're always learning, but it's always just, I feel like there's just a touch of luck in it too, you know? Yeah. You know, you yep. You've got to remember if it's a dry year to water or if it's a wet year to make sure your soil is draining. And if it's not sunny to make sure you can get sun to your plants. And <laughs> that's one reason I like planting in containers. If they get, you know, too dry too quick, I can move them so they're a little, get a little more shade and right that type yeah. of thing. So. Excellent. But yeah, any other questions out there? Well, those of you who are watching, if you've got a great garden, please send us some pictures. Send them to education at communityhomeworks.org. Um, we'd love to see your success or horror stories, either way. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's a real horror, horror story, we can send it on to Mandy and maybe she can give you a hint to correct it before next year. 
So absolutely. Thank you ever so much for being with us. And again, thanks for our sponsor this evening for providing this program and our Green Living series. Um, if there are other things as you're watching this that you would like to know of how to help reduce your carbon footprint or live a greener life, um, send us your ideas. Again, to education at communityhomeworks.org. Um, we are always looking for new ideas or new presenters, but we love Mandy and her good gardening tips. I feel like I learn so much every time you're on, and I do appreciate you helping us with this program. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a good time and everybody has some challenges. So hopefully we can all work together and learn a little bit more. Yeah, that's all we can do is help each other. And if you have a garden that's just overflowing and you don't have neighbors who want to help you eat it, um, I do know that loaves and fishes will take um, your garden harvest and share it with those who um, are in need of food or don't have a garden and would love to have a real fresh tomato or zucchini or squash or an onion. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So, well, thank you again. Anyone last call for questions? I don't see any. So thank you, Mandy. We'll see you again in the fall about how to put our garden to bed, maybe. Excellent. I know there's things you can do to in the fall to help it have a better start in the spring. So absolutely. We will have to get in touch with you to have that program for our listeners. Excellent. Thanks again. See thank you. you. See you in the fall. See you. <laughs> Bye.